around you, the trees are all around you, the shadows. Howard was the wonderful at creating shadows from outside overhangs and apertures. And you, you know that when you're living in it. It's anything but a box. Temple Emanuel had acquired a piece of property on Turtle Creek, and they had actually hired Eric Mendelson as the architect. And there is a design for it, but um, in their wisdom, they decided that it was too close to the railroad tracks and it didn't have enough parking. And so they did not take that piece of property and they uh, elected to move on Hillcrest, the corner of Hillcrest and Northwest Highway. And I don't think it was exactly a competition, but Howard uh, Meyer and Max Sanfield, who was a local architect, were both chosen as in partnership with William Worcester, who was an architect from uh, San Francisco. And so Worcester was kind of the, the mentoring architect, but I, I give cr a lot of credit to Howard for the way the temple eventually materialized. And interestingly enough, then a lot of the materials that he used at the temple were in this, a lot of the ideas and the coloring were very similar, very similar. The use of cork floors, the use of teak in Lynn's Hall, uh, the use of uh, adobe brick for the whole of Temple Emmanuel. Um, my father-in-law, Mr. Tobian, was chairman of the building committee. And we were pretty close to what was going on not pretty close, really close. So that the building of the temple was as much a part of our lives as the building of this house was. And so I was, I was pretty familiar with uh, what uh, was being selected. And um, the very fact that uh, Howard, I don't think it was Howard, I think you will find in the research that it was Sam Bloom who was maybe president at the time, located Yuri Kepish. And Kepish was an artist and a sculptor, and he happened to be at maybe North Texas at the time. Kepish is the gentleman who gave the art and art quality to the temple. He is the one who selected um, the artists to do the candelabra, that was Filipowski. He's the one who selected Annie Albers to do the tabernacle, to do the weaving. He's the one who selected Octavio Medellin uh, to do the uh, uh, mosaic tiles on the wall, the tabernacle wall. So knowing that and being a part of that, I got to know the temple very well, very well plus all the stained glass windows, that was all capish. So that everything, everything came together in the sanctuary. And the sanctuary is a very, very much um, heralded building. I have a deep feeling for it for several reasons. Um, I feel as though I am, need to be the protector for the building for Mr. Meyer. And having been chairman of the aesthetics committee for about eight years, that was easy to do because they, they always asked me, what would you do or what should we do? And it was always in mind, I always had Howard's wishes in mind um, when it came to coloring or wood or redoing the floors or whatever. I was very mindful of what Howard would have wanted. So the temple became very much a part of my life too. Howard was very difficult to work with. He um, was very definite in his opinions as are most architects and it was very difficult to dissuade him or get him off uh, on, another, on another tack or another track. 
He was very, very opinionated. And um, I, w I would not use the word arrogant because I don't think he was arrogant, but I think, I think he had such d definite ideas and, and style uh, of working. I think when you realize where Howard came from and the influences in his life, it was it was kind of understandable to see where he was where he was going. Uh, when you look at the Corbusier and when you look at uh, uh, the other Gropius, when you when you look at the modern architects in France, you you realize that Howard was enormously influenced by the Bauhaus. It's, it's easy to see. And so he was pretty, pretty definite in in his directions. But yeah, he was he was hard to work with, and also um, he was expensive, and it was hard to get him to change his mind or to do something that he thought was less important. Or it was it was difficult. As a matter of fact, I was probably a little bit afraid of Howard. When Jim and I um, bought the house on Nakoma, it needed a lot of a lot of restoration and a lot of work, and it was so fortunate that Howard was still alive, and he really didn't have anything to do at the time, and to give him the joy and the pleasure of recreating that house meant so much to him. He just adored doing it. He'd already done it once. And you know, it's probably very difficult for an architect to revisit what he'd done 20 years or more than that earlier. And it was probably hard for him. But on the other hand, he loved, he loved re recreating it. And he would take such pleasure in finding little nuances and things that that he had done once once before. All of the birch built-ins had been destroyed at the Nakoma House, and so it was to Howard's great amazement and delight he found exactly the same cabinet makers to redo them exactly according to his measurements and style as he had done some 20 years earlier. But the fun of it for him was when they went to replace them and rehang them, the screws to hang them into the ceiling went into exactly the same hole that had been there 20 years earlier. I mean, as an engineer, it was so precise, never moved. I think what the words that come to mind are um, his standards for excellence uh, in all things, whether it was music, um, art, literature. Uh, he had great intellectual standards. He had great intellectual curiosity. Um, his wife, Sean, was a, a very highly cultured woman and had great, great standards herself. They're friends. They surrounded themselves with people of similar, similar intellect and similar concerns. All of their friends were part of a cultured background, I would say, in the arts. And they reflected that. And I think Howard had great, great standards and was not going to settle for anything less. From having lived in Dallas since 1950, I think I can point with pride to the contributions that Howard made to the world of architecture and to modernism. Uh, I don't think it was here in Dallas without him. Uh, there will be conversations that will point to other architects of the time, but I think Howard was foremost in that regard. And I think that he did leave a legacy 
And that is the reason why we are working on this documentary because I think it needs to be protected, preserved and presented to young architects in a way that they will see it for what it's, for what it's worth. And we'll see modernism uh, in Dallas, Texas as something that's very important.